Okay, I think we'll get started and let the stragglers straggle in. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Alan Blinder in the Economics Department in the Woodrow Wilson School. It is a well-known cliché of introducers to say of the speakers that it is a pleasure to introduce X. Uh, I'm going to say that again, but with great emphasis. It is truly a pleasure to introduce Brooks Lee Bourne to this uh, audience and to Princeton. Uh, in case you don't know, I think you probably do, uh, Brooks Lee Bourne is one of, on a, a very, very, very short list, and that's the list of heroes of the financial crisis. The villains list is lengthy. That's what I meant by it being a pleasure. The villains list is very lengthy. The heroes list is extremely short. Uh, in 2009, uh, Brooksley was awarded the uh, John F. Kennedy Profiles in Courage Award for, uh, from the citation, the political courage she demonstrated in sounding early warnings about conditions that contributed to the current financial crisis. And in the presentation, Carolyn Kennedy noted, Brooksley Bourne recognized that the financial security of all Americans was being put to risk by the greed, negligence, and opposition of powerful and well-connected interests. You bet it was, and you bet she did. Uh, in 1998, Brooksley was chair of the CFTC, something a lot of people never heard of at the time, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Uh, and in that capacity, which, well, I used to be at the Fed, so I hate to say this, but probably doesn't sit at the top of the regulatory hierarchy. Uh, she had the guts to stick her neck out by suggesting, if you can imagine this, that maybe we should have a sensible regulatory regime for derivatives, which were growing like topsy, and had very recent, and, and that very year, later that very year, it was later, I think, long term, later that very year came pretty close to toppling the financial system when long-term capital management went kaput. Uh, for this perspicacity, she was attacked by the powers that be, uh, by the chairman of the Fed, the secretary of the Treasury, the deputy secretary of the Treasury, and the chair of the SEC, which is quite a formidable list of adversaries if you're, only, if you're the chair, well, for anybody, and if you're the chair of the uh, uh, CFTC. Uh, according to their uh, critique, if the country were to follow the path that Brooks Lee Bourne was suggesting then, it might threaten the very foundations of capitalism. <laughs> well, we learned that the very foundations of capitalism did get threatened uh, by not following it. Um, she left her post at the CFTC in 1999. The next year, Congress passed the odious Commodities Futures Modernization Act. I call it odious. There might have been some good things in it. But I call it odious because not only did it prevent, not only did it not establish a regulatory regime for derivatives, it basically banned the regulation of derivatives and told the regulators to keep their noses out of this precious business. To my mind, this was the absolute pinnacle of regulatory neglect, of which there was much in the run-up to the crisis, but I think that one took the cake. The rest, sad to say, is history, and you know the history. It's a history, by the way, that she recently helped tell as a member of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, which produced a wonderful report, which I'm sure you've all read. It's only about 600 pages of small font type. I've actually read it. It's a very good uh, piece of work. Uh, I want to finally note that this lecture series is entitled, and listen to the words, Economic Recovery, colon, Perils, Politics, and Possibilities. Well, this is extremely timely because, as many of you may know, the Dodd-Frank Act, which, among other things, tried to regulate, put some regulatory regime around derivatives, or tries, I should put it in the present tense, because it's being imperiled by politics, lobbying, fighting of all sorts, uh, right now, I have a suspicion we might hear a little bit about that. Is that right? Yeah, sounds like it is. Uh, and two of the main targets of this, uh, of this peril are proprietary trading and the regulation of derivative. So it truly is with extreme pleasure 
that I introduce to you Brooks Lee Bourne. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, and Alan, in his introduction, has kind of foreshadowed my talk this morning or this afternoon. I'm really delighted to be with you here today uh, to, and to participate in the Woodrow Wilson School series of lectures on economic recovery. In my view, there is no public policy issue of greater importance than determining the steps needed to prevent a recurrence of the devastating financial crisis we've suffered. That financial crisis and the economic crisis that followed it have demonstrated how vital financial regulatory reform is to the welfare of the American people. I thought this afternoon I would discuss some of my observations about the need for financial regulatory reform based on experiences I've had while serving on two federal commissions, the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which I chaired from 1996 to 1999, and the U.S. Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, or FCIC, on which I served from 2009 until 2011. Those experiences convinced me that a major cause of the financial crisis was the lack of adequate regulatory rules of the road to curb the excesses of financial markets and market participants. The financial crisis that we experienced in 2008 was not a routine downturn in the business cycle, but rather a near catastrophic occurrence that threatened to plunge the country and the world into a severe depression. Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, told the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, and I quote, as a scholar of the Great Depression, I honestly believe that September and October 2008 was the worst financial crisis in global history, including the Great Depression. As we all know, the impact of the financial crisis on the economy as a whole has been devastating and is still continuing. Trillions of taxpayer dollars have been committed through TARP and other programs to rescue large financial institutions, the auto industry, and other large corporations, to support the financial system, and to stimulate the economy. More than 22 million Americans are out of work, can't find full-time work, or have given up looking for work. About 4 million families have lost their homes through foreclosure, and millions more are in the foreclosure process or seriously behind in their payments. Trillions of dollars of household wealth has vanished with retirement accounts and life savings swept away. Businesses large and small have suffered through what we now call the Great Recession with many bankruptcies, layoffs, and retrenchments. States and municipalities are strapped for resources and have been forced to reduce need needed services. Moreover, the crisis is far from over, but rather is still being played out in the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, the U.S. housing market, and otherwise the impact of the financial crisis on our economy will be felt for a generation. We all need to understand why this crisis occurred. Unless we find the answers and respond appropriately to what we learn, the country and global economy may well suffer recurrent catastrophic crises. The Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission on which I served was established to investigate 
the causes of the financial crisis and the economic crisis, and to issue a report to the American public. That report was issued in January of last year after 18 months of investigation, including 19 days of public hearing, interviews with about 700 people, and review of millions of pages of documents. I commend the report to you as a comprehensive and accurate description of the crisis and its causes. Our ultimate conclusions were as follows. The financial crisis was avoidable. Widespread failures in financial regulation and supervision proved devastating to the stability of the nation's financial markets. Dramatic failures of corporate governance and risk management at many systemically important financial institutions were a key cause of the crisis. A combination of excessive borrowing, risky investments, and lack of transparency put the financial system on a collision course with crisis. The government was ill-prepared for the crisis and its inconsistent response added to the uncertainty and panic in the financial markets. And there was a systemic breakdown in accountability and ethics. I certainly agree with all of these conclusions, but would like to focus today on one of them, the inadequacies of financial regulation as a major cause of the crisis. Financial markets and market participants have repeatedly been subject to bubbles, panics, and other excesses. I believe that well-tailored government regulation can mitigate the impact of such excesses and is absolutely necessary to protect the public. In the lead-up to the financial crisis, 30 years of deregulatory pressures created near-fatal weaknesses in the financial system and in many of our largest financial institutions. As Federal Reserve Board Chairman Ben Bernanke told the FCIC, and I quote, prospective subprime losses were clearly not large enough on their own to account for the magnitude of the crisis. Rather, the system's vulnerabilities, together with gaps in the government's crisis response toolkit, were the principal explanations of why the crisis was so severe and had such a devastating effect on the broader economy. These vulnerabilities in our financial system were the direct result of a growing belief in the self-regulating nature of financial markets and the ability of financial firms to police themselves. Former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan, a laissez-faire economist, championed those beliefs during his 19 years in office. With support from large financial firms, their trade associations, and other like-minded economists, he was able to persuade a number of policymakers in several successive presidential administrations, members of Congress, and federal financial regulators to support deregulatory efforts on the false assumption that self-regulation would be sufficient to protect the financial system and our economy against excesses in the market. The financial sector in this country wields great political power and has devoted enormous resources to its efforts to convince federal policymakers of the need for deregulation. In the decade leading up to the financial crisis, the sector spent $2.7 billion on federal lobbying efforts, and individuals and political action committees related to the sector made more than $1 billion in federal election campaign contributions. 
As a result of these pressures, significant regulatory gaps developed in the financial system, including the lightly regulated shadow banking system that grew to rival the traditional banking system in size and importance, and the enormous market in deregulated over-the-counter derivatives. Mortgage lending standards deteriorated without meaningful intervention by banking regulators, and securitization of mortgage-related assets burgeoned with little regulatory scrutiny. A number of investment banks grew to be of systemic importance without adequate oversight. Institutional supervision of large bank holding companies commercial banks and thrifts was gradually weakened, allowing them to engage in riskier activities. These developments created the conditions that caused the collapse of the housing bubble to turn into a major financial crisis, perhaps the greatest in history. In order to illustrate the deregulatory forces that were at work in causing the financial crisis, I would like to focus on the role of unregulated over-the-counter derivatives. However, you must understand that other major failures in regulation that I just mentioned also played an important role in the crisis. The experience with over-the-counter derivatives is merely illustrative of a much more pervasive problem. When I became chair of the CFTC in the summer of 1996, the financial markets had been expanding, innovation was thriving, and the country was prosperous. Little did I suspect when I first took office that my experience at the CFTC would foreshadow the catastrophic financial crisis a decade later. The CFTC was in charge of overseeing futures and options trading on regulated exchanges. Futures and options are types of derivatives. That is, they are instruments the value of which is based on or derived from the price of some underlying asset, index, or event. Derivatives may be based on commodities, including agricultural products, energy products, and metals. They may be based on interest rates, currency rates, stock indices, or credit risk. They are not used for capital formation in the way that securities are. Rather, they're instruments used for hedging or insuring against business risk relating to changes in price or interest rate or the like. Or they can be used for speculating or gambling on the rise or fall of a price or interest rate. For example, a farmer can hedge the risk that the price of her crop will fall between now and the harvest by entering into a futures contract that will compensate her if the price does fall. On the other hand, a speculator with no interest in the crop could enter into the other side of such a futures contract if she wanted to bet that the price of the crop was going to go up. Such a bet could be heavy, heavily leveraged since the speculator would not actually have to buy the crop in order to profit on the price increase only a small initial payment would be required to enter the futures contract. That allows a successful speculator to have large winnings compared to the amount invested, but also exposes her to large losses. The CFTC was created to administer and enforce the provisions of the Commodity Exchange Act of 1974. That act required virtually all derivatives to be traded on a regulated exchange, and in so doing, provided significant benefits to the public and to market participants. 
trading on regulated exchanges, affords open access and transparent pricing, regulation of futures brokers and other intermediaries, rules for customer protection, prohibitions against fraud, manipulation, and excessive speculation, and surveillance of the market by the CFTC and exchange officials to detect or deter violations. In addition, regulated centralized clearing of exchange-traded derivatives provides protection against counterparty credit risk and large unexpected losses. The clearing operation becomes the counterparty to each side of the derivatives contract, marks the contract to the market price on at least a daily basis, and collects margin payments from the traders based on the daily price changes. If a trader does not pay the daily margin, his or her position is closed out by the clearing organization. Thus, the likelihood of a buildup of large exposures that can destabilize the market is reduced. Despite the Act's exchange trading requirement, during the 1980s, federal banking regulators began to permit commercial banks to act as dealers in derivatives, sometimes called swaps, that were traded over the counter and not on a regulated exchange. This development was surprising to me at the time, since those very same banks with federally insured deposits were prohibited from acting as dealers in securities under the Glass-Steagall Act, and securities dealing is arguably inherently much less risky than over-the-counter derivatives dealing. However, as it later became clear, this was part of a deregulatory pattern in which federal banking supervisors permitted banks to engage in increasingly risky activities and progressively undercut the protections provided to the public by the Glass-Steagall Act. Eventually, in 1999, Congress adopted the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, revoking what little remained of the relevant portions of Glass-Steagall. Let me describe the kinds of derivatives that banks were trading over the counter. Many over-the-counter derivatives, or swaps, are similar to futures contracts and can similarly be used to perfect, protect against business price or interest rate risk. In a swap, the two parties exchange or swap streams of payments. For example, a business that has a debt on which it must pay a floating rate of interest may want to protect against increasing interest rates. It can enter an interest rate swap with a bank acting as an over-the-counter derivatives dealer. The business agrees to make payments to the dealer based on a fixed rate of interest in return for the dealer's agreement to make payments to the business equivalent to the floating rate of interest. Thus, by engaging in a swap of payment streams, the business can be hedged, that is, insulated from higher interest rates. Of course, such swaps are not limited to hedging. Speculators, too, those who want to bet on changes in interest rates, can also enter into such swaps. In addition to interest rate swaps, swaps are commonly based on foreign exchange rates, securities and securities indices, commodity prices, and credit risk. Swaps based on credit risk played a special role in the financial crisis, as we shall learn. As this over-the-counter derivatives market began to grow, the banks and investment banks acting as dealers became increasingly concerned that the transactions might violate the exchange trading requirement of the Commodity Exchange Act. 
At their urging, Congress in 1992 amended the act to authorize the CFTC for the first time to exempt derivatives from the exchange trading requirement of the act if such exemption would be consistent with the public interest. <laughs> and they quickly found that it would be. In uh, January 1993, one of my predecessors as chair of the CFTC, Wendy Graham, led the commission in granting an exemption from exchange trading for certain non-standardized derivatives transactions between sophisticated parties. The underlying rationale for this decision was that such derivatives were useful in hedging specific business risks by large commercial and financial companies and could not feasibly be traded on exchange or centrally cleared because their terms were customized and therefore they were not part of a fungible group of standardized contracts. After Wendy Graham left the CFTC in 1993, she went on to the board of directors of Enron, which, which became a major dealer in the exempted over-the-counter derivatives. She served on Enron's board and its audit committee until its bankruptcy in 2001, the largest US bankruptcy up until that time. During the bankruptcy, it became clear that Enron had used over-the-counter derivatives fraudulently to disguise its financial condition from the investing public. Wendy Graham's relationship with Enron provides an example of the problems with the so-called revolving door. A government regulator weakens regulation and then resigns and obtains a lucrative position in the industry she regulated. This phenomenon has contributed to regulators' susceptibility to deregulatory pressures. After the CFTC granted this exemption from exchange trading in 1993, the over-the-counter derivatives market began to grow exponentially, and by 1997, when I was chair of the CFTC, it had grown from a very small market to over $28 trillion in notional amount. In exempting these transactions from exchange trading, the CFTC had expressly kept its anti-fraud and anti-manipulation enforcement authority over the market. By the time I took office, there was evidence of significant problems in this respect. For example, in 1994, Bankers Trust, a large bank and a large over-the-counter derivatives dealer, apparently had defrauded its customers, Procter & Gamble and Gibson greeting cards, resulting in their suffering millions of dollars of losses. In 1996, Japan's Sumitomo Corporation lost $2.6 billion after manipulating the price of copper through trading on a London futures exchange. The CFTC found that Sumitomo had, among other things, used over-the-counter derivatives to disguise and finance its illegal manipulative scheme. And the CFTC entered into large settlements with Sumitomo and its over-the-counter derivatives dealer, Merrill Lynch. Despite having anti-fraud and anti-manipulation responsibility for the over-the-counter derivatives market, the CFTC had not retained any reporting or record-keeping requirements or other investigative tools. For this reason, the CFTC's ability to conduct surveillance over the market or to enforce the anti-fraud and anti-manipulation provisions was significantly impaired. Furthermore, there had been a number of spectacular losses in the over-the-counter derivatives market indicating that speculation was rampant, leverage was excessive, 
and the market posed significant dangers. For example, in 1994, Orange County, California went bankrupt in the largest municipal bankruptcy up till that time because of its massive speculation with taxpayer money in over-the-counter interest rate derivatives. Its over-the-counter derivatives dealer, Merrill Lynch, paid $400 million to settle claims. A further major problem we saw was raised by the fact that over-the-counter derivatives market had evolved to include a large number of transactions which appeared to be standardized in their terms and thus capable of being traded on a regulated exchange. Indeed, they were so standardized that they became commonly known in the market as plain vanilla swaps. This raised serious questions about whether those transactions qualified for the exemption from exchange trading adopted by the CFTC in 1993, or whether instead they were violating the exchange trading requirement of the Act. For all these reasons, as chair of the CFTC, I became very concerned that the rapidly growing market posed significant dangers. No federal regulator, including the CFTC, had adequate information about the market to assess or manage its risks. However, it appeared that this market, which had been developed to help in managing risks, instead was creating them. While the CFTC could no longer ignore the problems in the market, there was an issue of how we should proceed. One option was to try to enforce the terms of the CFTC's exemption of over-the-counter derivatives from exchange trading by asking the Division of Enforcement at the Commission to investigate one or more of the large over-the-counter derivative dealers. If the investigation determined that the dealers were selling standardized derivatives that did not meet the exemption's terms, the CFTC could bring an enforcement action to require that they cease and desist from violating the exchange trading requirement of the Act. However, this option involves some significant obstacles. The potential defendants were the na nation's largest bank holding companies and investment banks, institutions such as J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, and Merrill Lynch. Their resources vastly exceeded those of the CFTC, which was a small agency with less than 600 employees and a modest budget. The prospect of successfully bringing enforcement actions against these institutions was daunting, to say the least. Moreover, enforcement actions might well have had the effect of destabilizing the rapidly growing market by making it clear that a significant portion of the transactions might be found to be illegal and therefore po potentially voidable by the participants. We had no desire to take an action that would impact the market in such an adverse way. But most importantly, this enforcement approach would not provide a basis for the CFTC to assess whether the terms of the 1993 exemption were appropriate in light of developments in the market. So we took a different course. In May 1998, we adopted and published what we called a concept release, which pointed out the troubling developments in the market, asked market participants for information about the market, which was not transparent at all, and sought public comment on whether the market required more transparency and more regulatory safeguards. To make it clear that existing contracts would not be affected by any regulatory changes that might later be proposed by the Commission, the concept release really stated firmly that any such changes would be prospective only. Nonetheless, this concept release, merely asking questions, 
resulted in a firestorm of opposition. The political power of the financial system uh, sector was unleashed with a fury. The operations of the over-the-counter derivatives dealers were growing quickly and were extremely profitable. They and their trade associations insisted that there should be no regulatory inquiry whatsoever into the market and suggested that they might take the business overseas. I should note that in the, at the same time, a new financial regulator in the United Kingdom, the Financial Services Authority, was actively trying to recruit U.S. financial firms to move business to London and thus escape what the British called heavy-handed U.S. regulation. These U.K. efforts certainly added impetus to an international regulatory race to the bottom that contributed to the financial crisis. The over-the-counter derivatives dealers used their political clout to persuade Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan, Secretary of the Treasury Robert Rubin, and Arthur Levitt, the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, to oppose the CFTC's concept release. Immediately after the issuance of the concept release, these officials jointly called on Congress to impose a moratorium stripping the CFTC of the ability to investigate over-the-counter derivatives or take regulatory or enforcement actions relating to it. Many congressional hearings were held on the subject, I've been told 17, at which I and other federal regulators were called to testify. Great political pressure was put, exerted, on the CFTC to withdraw the concept release and to renounce its jurisdiction. Virtually no one spoke in favor of the CFTC's position, partly because of the array of political power opposing it, and partly, I suspect, because of the seemingly esoteric nature of the subject matter. While this congressional debate was going on, in September 1998, long-term capital management, or LTCM, nearly collapsed because of its speculation in the over-the-counter derivatives market. LTCM was perhaps the largest hedge fund in the world and was not subject to meaningful government regulation because hedge funds had been allowed to develop without government oversight. So it was a virtually unregulated market participant in a virtually unregulated market. With only about $5 billion in capital, LTCM managed to acquire $1.25 trillion in notional amount of over-the-counter derivatives without the knowledge of any federal regulator or even of its derivatives counterparties, which included most of the major over-the-counter derivatives dealers. When the market turned against it, LTCM suddenly threatened to default on its obligation to these counterparties. This threat to the counterparty's financial stability raised the specter of systemic harm to the financial system. For that reason, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York had to step in on an emergency basis and persuade 14 of the large dealers, which were the hedge fund's counterparties, to contribute $3.6 billion to take over LTCM. The LTCM crisis tended to confirm a number of the CFTC's concerns. It showed that the lack of transparency in the over-the-counter derivatives marketplace had disguised a systemic danger from all federal financial regulators and from market participants until the brink of disaster. It demonstrated that large financial institutions acting as over-the-counter derivatives dealers were not exercising sufficient prudential controls in entering into transactions that could have devastating effects on them and the financial system. 
It showed the magnitude of speculation and leverage in the derivatives marketplace and the interconnections between derivatives counterparties that could lead to cascading losses to systemically significant institutions. This was a clear case of an institution that was bailed out because it was too interconnected with other financial institutions through over-the-counter derivatives contracts to be allowed to fail. Nonetheless, Despite this demonstration of the dangers of the market, a few weeks later, in October 1998, Congress adopted legislation prohibiting the CFTC to take action with respect to the over-the-counter derivatives market for a six-month period, which interestingly happened to coincide with the remainder of my term in office. Congress did ask the President's Working Group on Financial Markets to prepare a report on the over-the-counter derivatives market. The President's Working Group consisted of the Secretary of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve Board Chairman, the Chair of the SEC, and the Chair of the CFTC. Several months after my term ended and I had left office, in November 1999, the President's Working Group, which was then chaired by Larry Summers, the new Secretary of the Treasury, issued its report to Congress. The report recommended that financial over-the-counter derivatives should be totally deregulated. Accordingly, Congress passed the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000 which removed over-the-counter derivatives transactions between sophisticated counterparties from the jurisdiction of the CFTC. The statute also eliminated any oversight by the SEC except for fraud jurisdiction over certain securities-based swaps. Furthermore, the statute preempted state laws outlawing gaming and bucket shops which otherwise might have been applied to prohibit over-the-counter derivatives transactions. Thereafter, virtually no law applied to rein in the excesses of the over-the-counter derivatives market. As an aside, I might note that Senator Phil Graham of Texas, a laissez-faire economist and Wendy Graham's spouse, was instrumental in getting the act passed just as he had been in repealing important protections of the Glass-Steagall Act. The Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission concluded that this unregulated over-the-counter derivatives market contributed significantly to the financial crisis. It found that the enactment of the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000, quote, to ban the regulation by both the federal and state governments of over-the-counter derivatives was a key turning point in the march toward financial crisis." End quote. After that act passed, the over-the-counter derivatives market grew exponentially to almost $673 trillion in notional amount on the eve of the crisis in June of 2008 an amount more than 10 times the gross domestic product of all the countries in the world. As the FCIC found, this market was characterized by lack of transparency, uncontrolled leverage, lack of capital and margin requirements, excessive speculation, interconnections among firms through counterparty credit risk, and concentration of risk in systemically important institutions. The FCIC concluded that over-the-counter derivatives played several significant roles in the financial crisis. When the housing bubble burst, credit default swaps were at the center of the storm. Credit default swaps are over-the-counter derivatives contracts in which the seller agrees to pay the buyer in case of a default on a debt obligation. In exchange, the buyer makes a series of premium-like payments to the seller. 
Thus, an investor can buy a credit default swap from an over-the-counter derivatives dealer to ensure the payment of a debt obligation that he or she is owed. A speculator can also buy a credit default swap to get bet against payment of a debt that the speculator does not hold. For example, I could buy a credit default swap to bet that you will default on your mortgage. By December 2007, the credit default swaps market exceeded $57 trillion in notional amount. That is, these swaps had been written to ensure or speculate on the payment of more than $57 trillion in debt. Many of these credit default swaps were written on U.S. mortgage debt and mortgage-related securities. In the buildup to the housing market collapse, trillions of dollars worth of mortgages had been bundled by bank holding companies and investment banks into mortgage-related securities and then sold to investors. Investors in these mortgage-related securities were able to purchase credit default swaps to protect themselves from default on these securities. The reassurance provided to investors by these credit default swaps stimulated investment in mortgage-backed securities and thus helped to fuel the mortgage securitization pipeline. The resulting demand for mortgages further inflated the housing bubble, thus rendering its collapse all the more devastating. In addition, speculators were using credit default swaps to bet on mortgage-related securities. Famously, some hedge funds very successfully used the derivatives to bet that the U.S. mortgage market would collapse as the housing bubble burst. Without having any ownership interest in mortgages, they purchased what are called naked credit default swaps to bet that Americans would default on their mortgages. There have been some estimates that these naked credit default swaps greatly exceeded the amount of credit default swaps used as insurance by actual holders of debt obligations. One type of mortgage-related security contained large amounts of naked credit default swaps. As the housing market began to flatten and the supply of mortgages began to dry up, mortgage securitizers began to use credit default swaps to create a type of mortgage-related securities called synthetic collateralized debt obligations, or synthetic CDOs. To the extent that these synthetic CDOs consisted of credit default swaps, they were not actual mortgage assets at all, but rather were merely bets on mortgage securities. Those bets significantly amplified the losses from the collapse of the housing bubble, multiplying the amount riding on particular mortgage securities. Goldman Sachs alone created and sold more than $65 billion of such synthetic CDOs. Indeed, in July 2010, Goldman paid the largest SEC penalty in history, $550 million, for failing to disclose relevant information to investors in such a synthetic CDO. The near failure of AIG, the country's largest insurance company, was one of the precipitating causes of the financial crisis. AIG was an over-the-counter derivatives dealer that specialized, among other things, in issuing credit default swaps to investors who wished to insure against their exposure to default on mortgage-related securities or other debt, as well as to speculators who wished to bet that borrowers would default. In the run-up to the financial crisis, AIG, through these swaps, acquired exposure to half a trillion dollars of credit risk. 
This position included $79 billion of credit default swaps on very risky mortgage-related securities. When the housing bubble collapsed, these credit default swaps nearly brought down AIG. AIG had, sa had failed to set aside capital reserves or in any way hedge its exposure on these credit default swaps because it erroneously believed that it would never have to pay out on them. In sem September 2008, when AIG was unable to meet its obligations to post collateral on these derivatives, the federal government had to rescue it, ultimately committing more than $180 billion. This bailout was required because AIG's default on its credit default swaps obligations and its resulting collapse would have triggered losses cascading through the financial system. Ultimately, AIG's counterparties on these credit default swaps were paid the full face amount of the credit default swaps as part of the government's bailout of AIG. The benefiting counterparties included Goldman Sachs, Societe Generale, Merrill Lynch, and a number of other large banks and investment banks. The firms that had purchased credit default swaps based on the mortgage market were entitled to receive a great deal of money from the issuers when the housing bubble burst. And when the issuers like AIG could not pay out the American taxpayer had to step out, step up and do so in order to preserve the financial system. In addition to the important role of credit default swaps in the financial system, the FCIC also recognized that over-the-counter derivatives of all types played a major role. And I quote, the existence of millions of credit of, I'm sorry, the millions of derivatives contracts of all types between systemically important financial institutions unseen and unknown in this unregulated market added to uncertainty and escalated panic, helping to precipitate government assistance to these institutions. Because over-the-counter derivatives contracts created interconnections between firms through counterparty credit exposure, the failure of one large financial firm had the potential of spreading losses and failures throughout the financial system. The September 2008 bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, which was a party to more than 900,000 over-the-counter derivatives contracts, created panic in the market and almost brought down the financial system. That convinced government officials that AIG had to be bailed out because of its interconnections with other firms. Thus, the phenomenon we saw earlier with long-term capital management played a major role in the financial crisis. Firms were not merely too big to fail, they were too interconnected to be allowed to fail. As I pointed out earlier, the deregulation of over-the-counter derivatives is only one example of decades of pervasive deregulation and inadequate regulation found by the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission to have contributed significantly to the crisis. The major causative role of deregulation in the financial crisis demonstrates the fallacy of relying on self-regulation in a field so central to the American economy and the welfare of the American people. Rebuilding a regulatory scheme designed for modern financial markets is the challenge the country now faces. The enactment of financial regulatory reform in the Dodd-Frank Act in July 2010 was an important first step in doing so. The financial regulatory reforms relating to over-the-counter derivatives contained in that act are vital to strengthening the financial system and reducing systemic risk. 
Under the terms of the Act, much of the market will be subject to centralized clearing by regulating clearing operations, reducing the counterparty credit risk that created contagion during the financial crisis as the failure of financial institutions threatened their counterparties and the financial system as a whole. Trading of these transactions on regulated exchanges or swap execution facilities will provide critically important transparency and price discovery to market participants and the public and will permit government oversight of the market. However, some exemptions from the exchange trading and centralized clearing provisions in the Dodd-Frank Act will result in a continuing over-the-counter market. New rules relating to that market are designed to reduce its risks. Over-the-counter derivatives dealers will have to meet minimum capital and collateral requirements and will be subject to business conduct rules. Laws against fraud, manipulation, and excessive speculation will protect market participants and the public. Swap data repositories will facilitate transparency and government surveillance of the market. However, whether this continuing over-the-counter market will be adequately regulated under this new regime remains to be seen. The CFTC and the SEC, which have primary responsibility for implementing these provisions, have been acting diligently to propose a vast array of new regulations and to prepare to undertake the enormous new task of regulating the market. However, the Act's provisions must be fully implemented by the adoption of regulations and must be rigorously enforced to provide needed protection to the public. The over-the-counter derivatives market is still unregulated, and it's now bigger than ever, more than $707 trillion in notional amount as of June 2011. Until regulations called for, the, by, for by the Act are in effect, the financial system and the American public will continue to be exposed to the repercussions of large defaults, which might be triggered by the European sovereign debt crisis, problems in the housing or commercial real estate markets, the vulnerability of the municipal bond market, or other significant financial risks. Nevertheless, consistent with their past behavior, the large financial institutions their trade associations, and their allies in Congress are engaged in a concerted effort to prevent full implementation and enforcement of these and other provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act. Alan Greenspan himself has warned about alleged dire consequences of implementing some provisions of the Act and is again advocating reliance on self-regulation. Bills are pending in Congress that would repeal or weaken provisions of the Act. Efforts to persuade the agencies to issue watered-down regulations or to delay implementation of provisions of the Act are underway. Moreover, congressional limits on the funding of the CFTC imperil regulatory reform. Despite the CFTC's greatly increased new responsibilities under the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress has frozen its fiscal year 2012 budget at the 2011 level, one-third less than the White House proposed. This funding level will stifle the CFTC's ability to, to enforce the new regulations called for by the Act. The political power of the financial sector is still enormous, and policymakers in Congress, the executive branch, and the regulatory agencies must have the political will to resist these efforts to derail regulatory reform. If we do not learn from the financial crisis and put in place the needed re regulatory reforms to address its causes, 
we may well face future catastrophic crises. The American people deserve something better. Thank you.